bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, we will go ahead and have our scripture reading from Exodus 14, 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. Sorry, lost my place. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The pursuers drowned. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When I first looked at today's text, my uh, initial reaction to it was to say, wow, this is like a David versus Goliath moment. Even though David didn't come on the scene until much later, uh, there really isn't a way to explain this event, just like with David and Goliath. There's just no explanation for it. Uh, but to simply say that it is a great work of God and it's an incredible picture, really, of the lengths that God takes to do good works with us and in us. So when we last left Moses and his brother Aaron, they were warning Pharaoh and the Israelites of a terrible event that was about to happen. The Lord had previously sent signs and plagues to Egypt, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not release the Israelites under their captivity and hard labor under Pharaoh and his officials. Pharaoh's officials begged and pleaded with the Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave. But Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites leave 
along with their possessions. We don't know for sure which pharaoh this is in Egypt. Uh, most biblical scholars agree that this was Ramses II or Ramses the Great. He ruled on the throne of Egypt for a very long time. And he was known for two things, really. He was known for having um, a real big army um, and also having a navy, the start of a navy um, to protect Egypt, but also to use in particular the army to expand into other parts of Africa to enlarge his territory. So not only had he uh, developed this very large and very great army, but he also was known as a builder. And what did the Israelites do in Egypt? They built, they built. What did they build? We don't know for sure. However, we do know that Ramses II left behind many great monuments to his wealth, and Egypt was fabulously wealthy at this time, to his power, his economic power, and his political power, and also many temples and burial tombs um, to perpetuate his name. And indeed, his name has been perpetuated through history. Uh, if you go um, to Egypt, I have not been to Egypt, but uh, from what I understand um, from seeing those lovely specials from National Geographic, um, there are still uh, monuments that are there that were built during Ramses the second time. So he needed a lot of labor to get those monuments built. And we don't know for sure if, they, if that labor was done by Egyptians or by the Hebrews or a combination of both. But he did need a lot of people to build those monuments. And so we have Moses and Aaron who left Pharaoh and they go back to their people and they give instructions to the Israelites on how to avoid this coming terrible event that is about to happen. They instructed the people to have a celebration dinner, which would later be called Passover, which is still in a very important holiday celebrated by the Jewish people. And they were to prepare a spotless male lamb for dinner and to eat unleavened bread. The people were then to take the blood of the lamb and use it to mark the doorposts and then the lentil on top of the door with the lamb's blood and then to close the door and to stay in their houses until morning. So starting with uh, verse 28 of Exodus 12, we read the following. The Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. What terrible suffering this stubborn Pharaoh brought among his people. And stubbornness is truly a terrible leadership quality and the effects on the people were enormous. Pharaoh then summoned Moses and Aaron to his palace and then ordered them to leave along with the rest of the Israelites and all of their possessions. Pharaoh then asked them for a blessing and in addition to leaving Egypt with their herds and their flocks of animals, the Egyptians also gave the Israelites their gold and silver jewelry. 
along with clothing. And the Israelites plundered this very vastly wealthy country, just as God said that they would. We read that 600,000 male Israelites left, so you can take that number and double it very easily to include the women and children. And also, in addition, there were some Egyptians that joined them in leaving Egypt. The Israelites, as we read in Exodus, have lived in Egypt for 430 years. And as they were leaving, Moses also took the bones of Joseph with him. Moses instructed the people on the importance of their freedom from their bondage in Egypt. And just as the Lord had killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, the Lord, in turn, as part of his covenant with the people, required that every firstborn Hebrew be consecrated to the Lord. Then, starting with verse 5 of Exodus 14, we read the following. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of the Pharaoh and his officials were changed towards the people, and they said, what have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Pharaoh was going to pursue the Israelites using the best of the best of the best of his army. And these were effective soldiers. They were the best trained soldiers in Pharaoh's military. And soon with their chariots pulled by horses, they were approaching the Israelites. And the Israelites were fearful and said to Moses, starting in verse 11, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And I'm sure it was easy for Moses and Aaron to get very, very discouraged listening to this from the Israelites who were under bondage for so, so long, for several generations, many generations. And Moses reassures the people that the Lord will fight for them, even though Moses had some doubts himself. And he responds to the Lord in the following verse in 15. Why do you cry out to me? The Lord says, tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff, Moses, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. So I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. Allow me to take one little small diversion here. It's interesting that the Lord emphasizes again, twice, when he talks about the army, chariots, and chariot drivers. Ramses II was also known 
for his great army. The reason why he was so successful is because he had chariots and horses where other nations did not. And he literally ran over the opposing armies. And God is saying, that doesn't matter. Because the Israelites were surely aware of the way that Pharaoh used his military force against other countries. And even though we kind of give the Israelites a little bit of a hard time because God has done amazing work before all of this happens, but even the Egyptians also seem to forget God's great work. Even after they lost their firstborn children, they lost their livestock, and they lost their crops, their food, from grasshoppers and hail. And this will put Egypt in a vulnerable position. They forgot all this, but maybe they will acknowledge God again. An angel of the Lord leads the Israelites and leaves to go behind them. And the Israelites are surrounded by a pillar of cloud to hide their movements from the approaching chariots and Egyptian army. And then Moses stretches his hand out over the sea. The Lord sends a wind to divide the sea so that the Israelites are able to cross on dry ground. And if you've seen the Ten Commandments that's shown every year on TV, you've seen a great depiction of this, which is truly amazing before um, computer-aided graphics um, that Cecil B. DeMille was able to do this. But we see in this text the Israelites being able to cross on dry ground with walls of water on either side of them. Truly, it was an amazing work of God. And the Egyptian chariots tried to pursue the Israelites, but the Lord caused them to panic when the Lord clogged their chariot wheels, and maybe the horses panicked too. The Egyptians recognized that the Lord is fighting for the Israelites, so they decide it's time to leave and it's time to flee. But they recognize the Lord too late. Starting with verse 27, we read the following. So Moses stretched his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. God's great work has been done. And God works through Moses to bring about this destruction of the Egyptian army. And truly, Pharaoh has nothing left now. His army destroyed, the chariots gone, the horses gone. The only thing he has left is the monuments that surround him. His future looks bleak because his firstborn son also is no more. God did indeed do a great work. As it says in verse 31 of today's reading, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. But let's pause here for a minute and reflect on what just happened. Because like other texts in the Bible, this one presents us with a few thorny problems. And I admit 
that there are some texts that I don't quite understand what the Lord did and the actions that follow. And don't get me wrong, the Israelites suffered greatly under the hands of Egyptians. They were brutal. The, ta the taskmasters, the overseers, and Pharaoh treated the Israelites cruelly, less than animals. And God did a great work in rescuing the Israelites from the Egyptians who were pursuing the Israelites in the wilderness, not to bring them back to Egypt, but to utterly destroy them. The oppression of God's people could not last forever, and God would not allow it to. And it's the same in our present day history. God will not allow the oppression of God's people to last forever. Freedom comes eventually. However, there's something to consider with this text, and it's this. The deliverance of the people of God also meant the destruction for those who oppose that deliverance. It's impossible in this text not to have one without the other. And I think the danger sometimes with texts like this is that it's very easy to stereotype the different people groups in this text, to stereotype the Israelites and to stereotype the Egyptians. And we need to be careful with that because all of these people were human beings. And even the Egyptians were children of God, even if they did not acknowledge God. And thinking about it in that term, it's really bothersome, isn't it? That God's great work comes with so much destruction. There was collateral damage for the Egyptians who had nothing to do with the army, who had nothing to do with overseeing the Hebrew people in Egypt. And all of this because of the hard heart of one man in charge who would not listen to anyone. There were people who were destroyed. There were families that were torn apart as they deal with their grief of losing their firstborn child. The crops are destroyed. Famine is a very real possibility. The herds and the flocks, gone. And all this, by God. And I don't know what to make of that. I don't. And I think it's something that when we think about our relationship with God, we need to be honest with ourselves and say it's not always easy. And there are things that we just don't understand. And we need to take scripture as a whole and say this is part of God's story with us, but it's not the whole thing. And we also need to remember that in this text, we see the power of God and this power of God, this great work of God, enables the Israelites to now begin a new life. 
and that great work can also be done in each one of us as well to have new life. And we also need to remember that for God's great work to happen, we are in a covenant relationship with God. We work with each other. Just like the parting of the sea. Yes, that was done by God. And Moses had a part in that. Because in order for the sea to be parted, Moses had to lift up his hands. He had to believe. He had to be willing to work with God's great work. And we all want to see God do great work in our world to advance the kingdom of God on earth. We want to see our world that we live in be more like what God originally intended it to be. And thoughts and prayers are helpful I believe strongly in the power of prayer. And there's no doubt in my mind that your leadership, that your district superintendent, and that Pastor Julie has held this church in their prayers. And we have seen the work that God has done through their prayers. And with praying, there's also work to be done with the Lord. Thoughts and prayers are a good starting point, but it's not the end point. The end point is the work we do in response to our thoughts and our prayers. God is in relationship with us, which means that God works in us and through us and God's great work is done by God working in us through prayer and with action. So go to God and pray and listen to what God has to say to see what great work God wants you to do, what God's great work has for our church to do to bring about God's great work of advancing the kingdom of God on earth. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we will now have special music by Lila, Marcia, and Linda, and we are so grateful to have them bless us with this music today. Let your will be 
Thank you so much. As we prepare to give to the Lord our tithes, our gifts, and ourselves, we will offer this 